people joining pretty quickly, so we'll give it a minute. All right, well, I think we can go ahead and get started. Yeah. Great, thanks, Beck. So uh, hi, welcome everybody to today's brown bag. Uh, my name is Chelsea Batavia and I'm a senior environmental scientist with the Delta Science Program. I'll be moderating today's panel. So this is the final session of a three webinar series that's been hosted by the Delta Science Program with an overarching focus on governance in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. This series has aimed to shed light on the social, political, and institutional dimensions of Delta Science and management, helping us think about how those institutional structures and processes support effective and equitable environmental management in the Delta. I'd like to open today's program by inviting our Chief Deputy Executive Officer, Ryan Stamber, to say a few words acknowledging the original inhabitants and stewards of the Delta Estuary. Ryan, please. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, the focus of this brown bag series is governance in the Delta. As we engage in discussion around this, this topic, we must also reckon with the understanding that current institutional arrangements, power structures, and decision-making processes that comprise contemporary governance of the Bay Delta Estuary are the product of Western colonial settlement, which displaced the governance systems of Native, Native American peoples who continually occupied, managed, and stewarded the landscape for thousands of years. We acknowledge that the Delta and larger Bay Estuary is located within the ancestral territory of the native peoples of the numerous villages and tribes of the Bay Miwok, Coast Miwok, Plains Miwok, Maidu, Ohlone, Patwin, Homo, Wapo, Wintoon, and Yoketz, who make up tribal groups both recognized and unrecognized. We acknowledge that the Delta Stewardship Council, Delta Science Program, and other organizations represented here today are guests who have benefited from the violent history of colonization, colonization, excuse me, displacement and dispossession of native peoples from their traditional homelands. We wish to show our respect to them, their ancestors, and their sovereignty by acknowledging the injustice, injustices inherent in this history and their current efforts to achieve restorative justice. We acknowledge the ancestors, elders, and relatives and affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples. Consistent with the values of community, inclusion, and diversity, it is vitally important that we recognize that the land on which we reside in unceded, is unceded tribal territory and acknowledge and support the native peoples who continue to form a crucial part of the Bay Delta community today. Tribal communities have been stewarding our natural environment since time immemorial. There is much we need to learn from the estuaries, tribal communities about responsible stewardship and good governance. Please consider that although this statement acknowledges the ancestral and unceded territories of the original native peoples of the Bay Delta Estuary, additional steps are required to move towards meaningful restorative justice. This series is intended to catalyze reflection and dialogue on the distribution of power as it exists today as a legacy of Western colonial settlement and encourage action supporting tribes in exercising their authority as sovereign governing bodies and the original stewards of the estuary. 
Thank you very much, Ryan. So um, I have just a few introductory comments and then we will jump into our program. For the past two webinars in this series, um, both of which recordings are available online, by the way, um, but we've spent the majority of those programs with formal presentations by speakers. Today's panel opted to put more emphasis on dialogue, and so we've structured this session more as a conversation. So we have a set of questions to cover, but we'll also leave some time to answer questions from the audience. Please use the chat to submit your comments and questions throughout the webinar. Uh, my colleague, uh, Beck Barger will be monitoring and compiling those questions, and then we'll get to as many of those as we can toward the end. Um, I also want to take just a quick moment to give a big thanks to Beck for all of her support throughout this webinar series, uh, as well as Brandon Chapin, Jess Rudnick, Lauren Hastings, and Jenica Moffat, who also provided a ton of planning and logistics support. So thank you all. Uh, with that, let's get into the panel. So today we have a really fantastic lineup of speakers. I'll briefly introduce each of them and then we will jump into our questions. Uh, first, I'll introduce Dr. Tanya Heikola. So Tanya is a professor at the School of Public Affairs at the University of Colorado, Denver, where she also co-directs the Center for Policy and Democracy. Since 2020, she's also served as a member of the Delta Independent Science Board for the state of California. Her research and teaching focus on policy processes and environmental governance. She's particularly interested in how conflict and collaboration arise in policy processes and what types of institutions support collaboration, learning, and conflict resolution. Some of her research has explored these issues in the context of interstate watersheds, large-scale ecosystem restoration programs, and unconventional oil and gas development. She earned her MPA and PhD in public administration and policy from the University of Arizona, and a BA from the University of Oregon. Really happy to have Tanya here. Uh, next, I will introduce Dr. Nusha Ajami. Uh, Nusha is the Chief Research Strategy and Development Officer for the Earth and Environmental Sciences area at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. A leading expert in sustainable water resource management, smart cities, and the water energy food nexus. She uses uh, data science, uh, principles to study the human and policy dimensions of urban water and hydrologic systems. In her role at LBL, she's focused on developing interdisciplinary and impact-focused research initiatives across various domains within the program. Uh, Dr. Ajami is a mayoral appointee to the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. She serves as a member of the National Academy's Board on Water Science and Technology. Uh, she's a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institute and she sits on several state level and national advisory boards. Uh, she received her PhD in civil and environmental engineering from UC Irvine, uh, an MS in hydrology and water resources from the University of Arizona, and a BS in civil engineering from the Amir Kabir University of Technology in Tehran. Hopefully I said that right. Welcome Nusha, really happy to have you here. Uh, next, uh, Harriet Lai Ross. Uh, Harriet is the Assistant Planning Director at the Delta Stewardship Council, and she's managing the Council's comprehensive climate change study, Delta ADAPTS. Harriet's background is in land use and environmental planning, addressing issues throughout California related to developing sustainable communities, building climate resilience, conserving natural resources, and inclusive community engagement. She is experienced in translating best available science into effective policy, working with a wide range of interests to find common ground and preparing and implementing a large multidisciplinary plan at the local, regional, and state level. Harriet received her MA in urban planning from UCLA and her BS in environmental studies and BA in geography from UC Santa Barbara. Also really thrilled to have Harriet here today. Uh, finally, last but certainly not least, Dr. Hannah Gosnell. Hannah is a professor of geography at Oregon State University, and she studies biodiversity conservation, water resource management, climate change, and environmental governance in the context of rural working landscapes in the U.S. West. Her research addresses the human dimensions of natural resource management from a social ecological systems perspective. She's particularly interested in innovative approaches to Endangered Species Act implementation and strategies for engaging agricultural landowners in riparian aquatic ecosystem restoration. Her research is focused in part on the emergence, evolution, and devolution of collaborative adaptive governance in the Klamath Basin. We'll hear about that today. Hannah earned her MA and PhD in geography from the University of Colorado and a BA from Brown University. 
also really, really thrilled to have Hannah here today. And on a personal, Hannah, Hannah was on my graduate committee, so it's been very nice to reconnect with her. So those are our panelists, and we're going to go ahead and jump into our program now. And I'll open up with our first question, uh, which is quite broadly, what is adaptive governance? And um, each of our speakers, each of you brings a unique perspective and a body of experience to this topic. So I've asked each of you to spend a little bit of time providing that context as well in answering this first question. And we're going to start off with Tanya. Great, thanks, Chelsea. I'll wait for the slides to show up here. Sorry, Beth, if you could uh, put the slides up, that'd be great. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be part of this panel. And since Chelsea already introduced me, I'm just going to jump right into sharing some insights on what adaptive governance is. And the points I'm going to highlight today are largely synthesized from the extensive academic literature on adaptive governance. But I'll try to connect these ideas to the delta in our conversation today. So next slide, please. So adaptive governance, kind of put simply, involves governance systems that are adaptive. <laughs> and these governance systems are comprised of the actors, organizations, processes, policies, and laws that shape collective decisions. And uh, largely in the context of environmental governance um, and the governance of social ecological systems. And they can occur across multiple scales of authority and issues. But to be adaptive, these systems must have the capacity to respond to changing conditions, often under uncertainty, uh, typically with the goal of building resilience in social ecological systems. Next slide, please. So this concept of adaptive governance builds off of resilience theory, uh, some, sometimes called panarchy theory, developed by Holling and Gunderson. And, and if you're familiar with that theory, you might have seen this figure before. Uh, but in applying this uh, concept to adaptive governance, Chafin and Gunderson, in this article that I've referenced here, note that it, it highlights the role of episodic disturbances or these kind of changes or, or crises to a governance system um, that can happen across scale and, and trigger kind of reorganizations in governance. Uh, these are also thought of as sometimes periods of collapse or periods of rebirth in governance towards forms that have increased capacity uh, to function amidst complexity and uncertainty. So I'm not going to get into the details of the theory here. It's just important to know that the assumption underlying adaptive governance is this potential for the system to be resilient in the face of disturbances. Next slide, please. So many of you who have worked in the Delta might be more familiar with the concept of adaptive management. And I just briefly want to mention how adaptive management relates to adaptive governance. And I think we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the panel discussion. But adaptive governance, you can think of as creating the, the structure and the capacity uh, within which we design and implement adaptive management of specific programs or actions. However, adaptive management through its process of experimentation, monitoring and evaluation can also help identify where and when changes in governance are needed. So they interrelate and both emphasize processes of intentional learning. So next slide, please. So learning in adaptive governance isn't just about technical learning or learning from scientific data and monitoring and management of, of policy actions as we might think of in this concept of single loop learning, where we might be fixing you know, er errors we're observing in our management routines. It's often about some deeper forms of learning, um, which might include learning about values and goals of policies and adjusting those, those values, or even fundamental restructuring of the norms underlying our, underlying our governance system, uh, thought of as triple loop learning. Um, that could be changing who's allowed to engage in governance, for example. Next slide, please. Of course, learning and adaptation are not necessarily automatic. 
they're often hard, especially in complex systems. And I selected this image of Shasta Dam to help illustrate some of the types of constraints we might face on adaptive governance. I probably could have selected uh, an image of any dam, but um, this one I, I think is nicely illustrative of issues that appear in the Delta. So next slide, please. And what the kind of dam image illustrates is our tendency to build systems for stability and reliability. And when we build these systems, they can become path dependent. That is the infrastructure is very hard to change. The institutions, political and legal systems that are devised to support them and maintain them also become hard to change. And when changes are proposed or adaptation is proposed that can spur conflicts over the values and interests um, and identities of the, the people involved, especially if they feel that their um, pre-existing positions are, are threatened. And this can further slow the pace of change. Next slide. So given these challenges, uh, I just wanna highlight a few key lessons from the academic literature about what can help support adaptive governance. So first is that the structure of the system matters. And polycentric systems or those that have overlapping centers of authority are known from both empirical research and theoretical research to foster capacity for adaptive governance because they can allow for experimentation and diversity of ideas and approaches to governance but they require good mechanisms for coordination and collaboration. So the image on the left, you might also be familiar with, uh, it's a representation of the, the polycentric nature of the, the Delta Science Enterprise um, with the multiple organizations and diverse venues where um, science decision-making happens in the Delta. And of course, it's just one slice of the Delta governance system. And while some people might worry that such a complex system looks like chaos, <laughs> They, these types of systems can be supported, supportive of adaptive governance if coordination and collaboration are designed effectively. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna, oh, back one, there we go. So in addition to the structure, processes also matter for adaptive governance. And some of the criteria that we know are important for just good governance processes generally are even more important for adaptive governance largely because we need processes that support learning and experimentation and diversity of knowledge and ideas. So we need things like diverse actors who have legitimacy and equity in participation. We need to be able to diagnose and resolve conflicts and particularly build trust and social learning. Next slide. And finally, the laws and policies and rules matter for shaping the structure and the processes I just mentioned of adaptive governance, such as who has rights in, in decision making, uh, what are the boundaries of those decisions. Um, these rules also allocate the resources that we might need for adaptive capacity and determine the balance that we might need between flexibility and stability. So just as an example, the Delta Reform Act of 2009 uh, provides laws that structure the capacity for adaptive governance in the Delta. It emerged in response to a former process that was unraveling the CalFed process and set up new standards for who has authority, where the boundaries of that authority lie, and created organizational and financial resources, uh, for example, through the Del Delta Stewardship Council and other agencies, to set up the framework for requiring a plan that's regularly reviewed scientifically and updated, of course, that framework may not be perfect, and may, one may question whether it's achieving the goals of resilience that underlies adaptive governance. Um, and the approach taken for implementation has been challenged. Um, but recent court decisions, for example, have recognized and, and acknowledged that the stability of that system um, can continue on and help reinforce the adaptive approach to continue. So with that, next slide, I'm just gonna wrap that up and uh, pass it on to our next speaker. I think I have some references on the, on the final slide, but um, I look forward to more discussion and certainly questions people have. Thank you so much, Tanya, for laying that fantastic background. Um, so we're gonna move right to uh, Nusha to answer the same question from your perspective, what is adaptive governance? 
Thank you so much, Chelsea, and thanks, Tanya, for uh, setting this up so nicely. Um, it's, I'm delighted to be here and being part of this discussion. Um, I'm going to uh, provide the same uh, story, but from a sort of an engineering context and how it sort of fits into this discussion. Uh, I'm an engineering by, engineer by training, and um, uh, uh, as uh, many of you might know, engineers and decision makers are grappling with how we can rethink our um, governance and management uh, structure to, in order to build climate resilience. So that's how um, I approach adaptive governance. Oh, sorry, next. I'm trying to hit the button myself to move next. Um, this, is, uh, this is what generally drives a lot of the work um, that my team and I have been doing, which is we live in a world defined by 19th century laws, 20th century infrastructure. However, we are facing 21st century water challenges or environmental challenges. And the reality is neither 19th century laws nor the 20th century infrastructure are um, able or capable to respond to some of these challenges. Next, please. So the 20th century approach to water management or in, uh, was very much infrastructure heavy and siloed. Uh, we, we took these watersheds and then we started putting all these centralized systems on top of them in order to be able to create, um, for example, in my case, water reliability and water security in the context that we could understand. And, and with that, next please. Um, and with that, we assumed, uh, oh, can you go, back? oh, wow, okay, perfect. This is what I was looking for. And with that, we assumed, we can create abundance. We assumed hydrologic stationarity, meaning that um, you know climate and hydrology would repeat itself over and over. So we can manage the system without necessarily thinking about uncertainty and and um, and flexibility. We created um, a very like top down and rigid uh, and siloed governance structures that would enable this management. And one thing that we really didn't do was incorporating ecosystem and human behavior in part of, as part of this process, which then eventually in the 21st century challenges we are facing is showing to be a big challenge. And just in the context of water, just to show you how we siloed the system is we divided it into different sections and different parts geographically fragmented it. And then also on top of that, we said, people will provide water supply are in this spot, bucket, people who provide, uh, deal with uh, flood management are in this bucket and wastewater in this bucket. And you can see none of these, there's a conversation about ecosystem or environmental consequences. Next, please. However, this worked for about 150 to 100 years, but we are facing these challenges, such as the challenges that we are facing with because of climate change, floods, fires, droughts, and California has been in this extensive drought since the early 2000s, just in and out, in and out, uh, the, uh, in and out of these severe, long, hot droughts, uh, dealing with sea level rise. Just think about all the impacts of climate change that are sort of manifesting through water systems and water cycle. Uh, urbanization, aging infrastructure, and also some of the environmental externalities that we are facing. Next, please. So we are sort of realizing that this siloed, fragmented uh, system that we have put together doesn't necessarily work. And we actually have to, instead of fighting nature, which was our model in the 20th century, like we built things that would let us sort of conquer nature and enable us survive how we want and where we want without necessarily considering the, the its environmental consequences. And we put them in this sort of, um, we are realizing that we have to work with nature if we want to uh, deal with our 21st century challenges. So if I tell you infrastructure, you think about dams, roads, wastewater treatment plants, and um, you know um, uh, hydropower, and then next please. And then if I think about it in the 21st century, it's going to be more like 
uh, think about uh, Delta as a living natural infrastructure, think about um, uh, marshlands and wetlands and all these na natural systems that are sort of playing a major role in enabling us fight climate change or work or create um, a, a sort of like a, um, an opportunity for us to deal with some of the consequences of climate change that we are facing. And the challenge is how do you put these two pieces, the top row and the bottom row together? How do you manage them together? How do you make sure you can fund and finance or actually govern them in a way that we have done over time? Next, please. So the challenge with nature-based solutions, they're not singularly oriented and they have multiple benefits. But when you think about um, conventional infrastructure that we depend on is very singularly oriented. We are providing, we are using dams to provide water. Yes, we do actually flood management and, um, and um, uh, an electricity generation, but they're very much um, specifically designed to do very specific things. And we can measure that. We can say, this is how much water this provides. This is how much electricity it provides. This is how much uh, flood management we can do with this dam. But when it comes to nature, this is not how it works. It's very broad and it's not singular. So it's very difficult. Next, please. So when it comes to permitting or building these kind of infrastructure, then we are when thinking about the fragmentation that we have created, it's going, it makes it very difficult to, for us to build climate resiliency, because if we want to build a, let's say, horizontal levee or an infrastructure that's sort of nature-based or green infrastructure, we have to go to so many different loops and hoops, get different permits, meet different requirements, meet, meet different performance measures. And often in, at this part of this process, sometimes you see it's much easier and faster to go through the uh, conventional infrastructure path it's easier, it's faster, but it's not. And, but however, when it comes to these nature-based solutions, it's much more complex and harder to uh, fund them. Next, please. So when I be so when I think about adaptive governance and transitioning to adaptive governance, this is how I think about it. I think about regulatory rigidity, and as part of that, I, the question is: What is infrastructure? How do we define it? Do we think about infrastructure as a broad context of the tree in your backyard, the delta, the um, the, the marshlands and wetlands, or are we thinking about the gray infrastructure? How do we measure performance of these new inf new vision that we have around infrastructure? compared to the, our conventional infrastructure model. And then who and how are we going to finance this? And on the top of that, we have on top of that, we have to think about this fragmentation as part of this process. Who's involved and why are they involved? How many of these, for example, agencies are involved in permitting one solution? Um, and uh, what is what is the stake for each one of them in this process? How do we create flexibility around that? How do we measure performance across these agency and regulatory bodies in order to be able to uh, uh, permit solutions that are in important for us to become uh, climate resilient, but we don't necessarily, uh, doesn't singularly serve a one single purpose. And then which governing or management bodies should pay for this kind of infrastructure design? Next, please. So um, I put these questions out because these are the questions when I think about adaptive governance, I think about and how we need to sort of revise and repurpose and rethink our governance structure and how we need to move toward adaptive governance. And I, I'm gonna close with this code, which I, it, I love. It's just, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. And that is exactly the time and stage we are in because we are trying to fit our current solutions into our old and conventional um, governance structure that we have. And it's just, clashing in so many different ways. So adapt, adaptive governance is key um, in this transition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nusha. That was just great. And the really interesting and clear framing of the challenge and the questions that we face and some of the need. So thank you. Next, we will move on to Harriet. And again, we'll ask her to answer the question from your perspective, what is adaptive governance? Yeah, good afternoon, um, everyone. Harriet Ross with the Delta Stewardship Council. 
Um, this, however, is not my slide. So, yep, there we go. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about the need for adaptive governance in the Delta really through the lens of the Council's climate change study, Delta DAPS. I know many of you on this call have heard me talk about this. Um, so today it's a little bit different in that I'm going to talk about how the governance system really needs to change to allow for more effective adaptation. Um, right now, implementation of climate adaptation is primarily happening at the local level because local governments have land use authority to approve projects or broader at the state level. Um, and those projects are really aimed to protect um, the state's interests. But I think adaptation really needs to be implemented at a regional scale in order to be more effective. So um, as most of you know, there are currently over 200 different entities with some authority in the Delta. Um, which is really why uh, makes working here so interesting. Um, there are, however, far less entities in the Delta with some authority for climate change planning at the federal, state, regional, and local levels. But still, there's a lot of different entities to coordinate implementation within a region. And, and that's where that fragmentation comes in that, that Nusha highlighted. Um, and there are even far less of these entities with adopted adaptation policies. There are a lot of vulnerability assessments out there, um, but not a lot of adaptation plans. And this really highlights how difficult adaptation can be. Now, the state has adopted a, a number of um, adaptation plans recently, um, but these tend to be higher level guiding documents, and they really aren't regulations. Um, so climate change planning at these various levels tend to focus on the assets the entity owns versus all of the assets in, say, a particular geographic area. Um, so climate change planning can be fragmented and not comprehensive. Next slide, please. So just to give you a little background to, to set up um, what we'll be talking about today um, is what the state, I'll start off with what the state actually requires in terms of addressing climate change. Um, so in the past, the state really focused on climate mitigation with the passage of AB 32 and SB 375. And it really wasn't until 2015 that the state really shifted to addressing adaptation. And, and that's with the passage of SB 379. And SB 379 really required local governments to address climate adaptation and resiliency in their general plans. So another important thing, um, again, by way of context to understand is that is that the state delegates land use authority to cities and counties. So it can be difficult to implement adaptation on a regional scale when the ability to approve projects rests primarily at the local level. So in the Delta, this is where the struggle between the state and local governments can come to light. Local entities don't want the state to come in and mandate action. Meanwhile, the state is trying to protect its interest for you know, the greater good with, of the state and its residents without local land use authority. Um, it's important to note that the state can do what they want on the land that they own. They can build projects, and, and that happens all the time. Um, but the state doesn't have to comply with local regulations, which furthers the conflict. Next slide, please. So the current governance system for climate change planning and adaptation um, in the state makes it difficult um, to address these very issues. Um, planning, permitting, implementation, and funding of projects can rest with different entities in the Delta. We all know, um, you know, the biggest challenge with that is that climate impacts don't stop at jurisdictional boundaries, and you often need to consider solutions that have to be implemented for a much larger geographic area. Another challenge just highlights for an area like the Delta that has multiple cities and counties is that each jurisdiction tends you know, to have their own assumptions they wanna make um, to assess climate vulnerabilities, their own models they wanna to use to forecast impacts, and, and this can all yield different results for neighboring jurisdictions. Each entity also has their own political agendas, their own tolerance for risk, so it can be difficult to agree on strategies to address impacts. Um, each jurisdiction has their own budget to address climate vulnerabilities, and often this, you know, there can be a mismatch of funding to address adaptation um, compared to the impacts um, a location is experiencing. Um, and also the, the way, you know, without going into local government financing and municipal financing, um, each jurisdiction is really trying to maximize benefit for their own constituents and not necessarily for the greater good because that's, that's not their charge. Um, and local priorities don't always align. 
Um, also, another big challenge is, um, you know, in general, there's just not enough funding to address climate impacts. Um, you know, the Delta is not unique in that, and that's everywhere. Um, the $3.7 billion climate resilience budget that was passed by the state last year begins to help, but won't, you know, pay for everything. And lastly, a big challenge um, is that not everyone agrees on how to address or adapt to climate change and what needs to be done. So next slide. Um, yeah, so what are some potential solutions? And, and I think this is where adaptive governance comes in and we really need to approach climate planning and implementation of adaptation at the regional level. Um, Delta adapts is comprehensively planning for climate change for the region, like many other regions throughout the state and, and the country. Um, BCDC is another example for a regional planning effort for the San Francisco Bay as a whole. There's an adaptation plan that Silicon Valley and all of the um, cities and counties that make up the Silicon Valley um, have come together and put on put together their own regional plan. These are just a, a few examples. Um, but implementation of adaptation is not widely occurring at a regional level. And that's because of you know, the challenges we talked about in planning, permitting, implementation, funding of projects are just involved so many entities. And um, again, the local governments have that land use control. So ideally, we would have, um, you, know, you know, if we could, if I could wave a magic wand, we'd, we'd have a regional entity with, with authority, with teeth, and a dedicated stream of funding to implement adaptation projects that a whole region, um, you know, have provided input and, and agreed upon um, that, that they need. Um, but that doesn't exist here in the Delta, nor in many other um, regions. Um, and so, you know, part of the reason why I think regional planning um, and this regional entity is needed is that many important societal issues in the state are already being addressed at the regional level, like transportation improvements, sustainable development, greenhouse gas emission reduction, housing needs, for example. Um, regional entities were formed um, to prepare a regional plan to address these issues and to implement or fund projects that are consistent with that plan. So why can't we approach implementation of an adaptation in that same way? And, and, you know, we start to see this is where things are going. You can see it with the, the 2021 climate resilience budget and the bills that have been proposed or, or active now, both legislation and funding are going in the direction of creation of regional collaboratives and regional planning. Um, it's not the regional entity with teeth and dedicated funding, but we're, we're getting closer. So I think with that, I'm, I'm going to uh, turn it over to the next speaker, but I think that gives context for the discussion. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Harriet. It's really insightful. And I'm, just, I'm thinking about how, you know, Nusha just told us about this tension between like the engineering infrastructure based approach and nature based solution. And now you're articulating a different set of tensions between these different scales of governance and just really highlights the complexity. And I think a common theme there is the fragmentation of the system. So super interesting. But I will not editorialize anymore. We will move on to our last uh, and final speaker on this question. So Hannah, what is adaptive governance uh, bringing your perspective from outside the Delta? Uh, thanks, Chelsea. And, and just first of all, just thanks so much for having me. And it is so wonderful to see you in such an exciting position after having been yeah, on your committee and seeing you grow and evolve as a PhD student and into the senior scientist that you are today. So it's just a, a really interesting um, series that you put together and so many parallels between um, the Bay Delta and the climate situation. So, so I first became interested in um, the concept of adaptive governance in the mid 2000s when I came to Oregon State University and I started studying the emergence and evolution of collaborative conservation in the Klamath Basin. And so Chelsea asked me to provide a brief overview of the situation there and say a bit about why I think it provides really interesting insights into the possibilities for adaptive governance, as well as the potential pitfalls. So next slide. So uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Klamath just up the road from you, but um, to get you oriented, the upper and lower basins, uh, roughly above and below the Oregon-California border, um, they're, the, they're, these two basins are geographically distinct with separate sets of issues. And it's a huge complicated basin. The upper basin itself is the size of Connecticut. So in the upper basin, the key features upper Klamath Lake, the largest lake in Oregon, near Crater Lake National Park. And until the 20th century, 
uh, it, it was marshy, lots of wetlands, habitat for sucker fish. Uh, it was really good herb, bird habitat. And it's an important stopover. It continues to be a really important stopover on the Pacific Flyway. And salmon used to migrate all the way up into the tributaries above Klamath Lake. There's three main tributaries to the lake, the Wood, the Williamson, and the Sprague, and that's mostly ranching now. Um, but importantly, this region has been Klamath tribes territory for thousands of years. Then in the lower basin, you've got three other tribes, the Karuk, the Uroc, and the Hoopa Valley tribes, and they're all salmon fishing peoples. And um, down there you have a lot of forest, less agriculture, uh, history of poor forest management practices, and then of course salmon fishermen on the Oregon coast are also important stakeholders in, in the lower basin in the, in the current conflict. So next slide. Oh no, wait, actually um, stay on that one for a sec. The story of the um, the story of the Klamath case study can be framed in a lot of different ways. And one way is to look at how federal and state governments have transformed the landscape, largely to accommodate irrigated agriculture with the Bureau of Reclamation's Klamath project. And now uh, using that 20th century infrastructure and conquering mentality that Nusha was just uh, referencing. Um, also the off project lands above the lake, there's a lot of irrigation going on up there too. Um, both of these have led to problems with habitat loss for a number of species. There was also a lot of over-promising of water to diverse interests over time in a really incoherent way, leading to really an intractable mess. So due to degraded habitat and problems with water quality and quantity, two sucker species important to the Klamath tribes were listed under the ESA in 1988. And so throughout the 1990s, there, were grow there was growing tension as Fish and Wildlife Service and the Bureau of Reclamation tried to figure out biological opinions that would leave enough water in the lake for the two listed fish, but also allow farmers to continue irrigating and allow enough water to flow downstream for the salmon in the lower basin and complicating matters. The coho salmon was listed as threatened in 1997. Okay, next slide. So these tensions all came to a head in 2001. Um, the snowpack was at 32%, lake levels were down below the levels required for the fish under the ESA, and under Section 7, um, Bureau, the Bureau had to consult with Fish and Wildlife Service regarding the endangered fish, and also National Marine Fisheries Service had to consult with the Bureau regarding the threatened salmon in the lower basin. They were trying to balance keeping enough water in the upper basin for the sucker fish and the farmers while releasing enough to the lower basin for the salmon, and this resulted in the Bureau shutting off water to the farmers in the summer of 2001 leaving thousands of acres without irrigation, estimated $35 million in lost farm income. Next slide. So this of course led to outrage in the basin and throughout the West, it made national news, it even made international news. My friends in New Zealand heard about it down there and um, it became the poster child for the evils of the Endangered Species Act and, and the federal government generally. Um, protesters came to town, acts of civil disobedience, people trying to open the head gates, there were death threats, the National Guard was there, there were lots of American flags, including some of them hanging upside down, which is the international symbol of distress. There was lots of symbolic acts of support, like filling jugs with water and pouring them into the irrigation canals, and you can see a sign here that says, call 911, some sucker stole my water. Um, so next slide. So fast forward to when I started doing research down there uh, in 2006, just, just five years after all the chaos and crisis of 2001, there were signs that stakeholders were starting to come together to solve problems on their own, having lost faith in the ability of the federal government to do it for them. So there were a number of innovative grassroots efforts, which in combination with the dam relicensing process led by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, um, there was an alternative dam relicensing process that involved that required all the key stakeholders to be involved and, and those talks scaled up to become whole basin settlement talks. So there were formal monthly meetings between the 28 key basin stakeholders regarding dam removal um, versus retrofitting the dams for fish passage. And then, um, and then importantly for adaptive governance, um, hundreds of informal side meetings involving additional people facilitated by local and regional groups. And over time, a new goal emerged, which was to address all the major conflicts in one document instead of just the dam issue. So they decided, let's, you know, as long as we're all here together, let's look at, let's look at the water issues, the power issues, the endangered species issues, the tribal claims. Um, and the process transitioned from a consensus process to a coalition process in 2007. So um, it went from FERC meetings to closed um, Indian water rights settlement talks and trying in an effort to avoid FACA. So the talks, those talks were held in strict confidentiality and they created space for people to be vulnerable and really share with each other some possibilities for, for solutions. And so the KBRA and K, the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement and the Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement, the two of them together, the Klamath Agreements, 
uh, were signed in February 2010, and then legislation introduced these proposals to Congress in 2011. Next slide. And um, what this, what the KBRA and KHSA included were kind of a triple bottom line approach. It was very, it was you know considered one of the you know most comprehensive, amazing, holistic, integrated approaches to basin wide restoration the world had ever seen. It was like that, you know it was really exciting uh, around 2010. A lot of hope and and and. Uh, celebrating around this. Um, it was a set of negotiated agreements. And um, for the ecosystems, there was guaranteed in-stream flows for sucker recovery. There was a plan for the dam removal. Uh, salmon were gonna be reintroduced to the upper basin. Um, uh, there are uh, guarantees for water for the national wildlife refuges. For the tribes, importantly, um, some rectification, settlement of tribal water claims in the upper basin, return of some tribal land to the Klamath tribes and money for economic development to do small scale forestry and have a biomass plant. And then for the irrigators, also really importantly, politically to make sure that they had what they needed, some certainty for the farmers, guaranteed flows, reductions during drought years, um, and uh, a safe harbor agreement to avoid liability for salmon recovery after reintroduction. Also, there was a plan to retire irrigated ag on the off project lands and, and using kind of a, um, a voluntary basis so that irrigators would be able to be bought out on voluntary basis. Next slide. Next slide just gives you a sense of who was involved. And you can see there's a lot of overlap with what, what you're dealing with in the, in the down in, in the Bay Delta, um, a lot of the same um, uh, entities. But it was just a pretty impressive group of federal agencies and NGOs and tribes and Farmers and Bureau of Reclamation, and um, uh, anyway. So next slide just gives you an idea of who was on, who was involved in this. And then just you know, like I said, it's kind of a lot of attention. Uh, people were excited about this is you know a real sign of achieving peace on the river. We stand for fish and farms, rivers and ranches. We stand for all the communities and the resources of the Klamath Basin. And then um, Chronicle, uh, San, Francisco, San Francisco Chronicle reported that in the Western Water Wars, this is the equivalent of the Berlin Wall coming down. Um, next slide. So in thinking about um, adaptive governance, as, as this was all going on, I was getting into the literature on adaptive governance, and it really seemed like the Klamath Basin experience aligned in a lot of ways with the Jap adaptive governance principles. Um, so with my student, Brian Chaffin, my PhD student, Brian Chaffin, whose article Tanya cited earlier, um, we focused our research on understanding the ways in which the KVRA exemplified adaptive governance. And this is just an abbreviated list of what we found in regards to the evidence of adaptive governance emergence. Um, at, you know, there was crisis, and then the, and chaos, and then there was self-organization emerging after 2001, which can be seen as a release in the adaptive cycle that Tanya mentioned earlier. And what happened in the aftermath of 2001 can really be thought of as a period of reorganization involving new leadership amongst key stakeholders, so tribes, ranchers, and farmers, and also a period of really slow and steady trust building. Um, there was, uh, I, importantly, there was an identification of a desired state for the social ecological system. Over time, parties came together and they could, they could see a future that they all kind of agreed on that would be good for everybody. And that's key for adaptive governance. Um, and that, that, does, that identification of a desired state was really made possible by a window of opportunity, the FERC relicensing process, which happens every 50 years, just so happened that that coincided with you know, the aftermath of 2001. People had to come together to talk about dam removal, it created space to start to have these important conversations. And out of that process, the FERC process, there was the growth and strengthening of informal networks and lots of informal communication during the period of, the, of KBRA negotiation. And then also key to all of this was a culture of learning. As Tanya pointed out, um, a part of the efforts, uh, part of efforts at adaptive management in the Klamath. The Upper Klamath Basin people were learning about lower Klamath Basin conditions and vice versa. And, and, and as a result, developing empathy for each other, as well as a better understanding of the whole system and how it could be managed in a more holistic, integrated way. And um, in many ways, it seemed that there was a, a double and triple loop learning going on, as Tanya referred to. Uh, there were shifting values. Irrigators were coming to understand the tribe's point of view and vice versa. And there were also attempts to correct errors by designing new governance norms and protocols, the triple loop learning. And so finally, and importantly, the um, KBRA included plans for institutional change. They were planning for peace on the river and a Klamath Basin Coordinating Council was proposed. And that would have been comprised of the 28 key stakeholders from the entire basin. They would have been uh, a formalized institution that, that would, would work together to figure out how to share water in times of shortage. That would have been really an antidote to that upper basin, lower basin siloed fragmented approach to managing the system. Um, and as again, as Tanya mentioned, the key feature of adaptive governance is the capacity to respond to changing conditions, often under uncertainty, and the KBCC would have really allowed for that possibility. 
And they'd also thought about process. There were plans for legitimacy, that diverse actors would have had the author equal authority to participate. They, they had thought about equity. They had thought about conflict assessment and resolution mechanisms. And this was all gonna take place in a context of ongoing trust building and social learning opportunities. So yeah, it all sounds kind of like kumbaya. It was really amazing. They brought it to you know the governors of California and Oregon signed on. They brought it to, to Congress and um, they, that they said to Congress, you know, this whole thing, it's going to solve a lot of our problems, and it's it's going to cost about a billion dollars. And um, Congress decided not to fund it. So next slide. So where are they now? The basin is really back in a state of disarray. There have been many reflections on how things would have been better if there had been a KBCC, a Climate Basin Coordinating Council, to help navigate uh, this you know recent times of crisis and uncertainty in the last few years. So the lesson here, I think, is that adaptive governance involves bottom up and top down dynamics. Without the formal institutionalization by the federal government, adaptive governance can really only go so far. And so there's remnants of the informal networks that were created, but there's really more animosity than ever due to ongoing drought and water shortages, um, the 2013 quantification of Klamath Tribe's water rights, which led to curtailment for many irrigators and the tributaries to Klamath Lake. And then of course the ongoing section seven biological opinions that restrict water for the project farmers. And so as a result of Brian's research, we really concluded that the most pressing work to be done with regards to adaptive governance is to determine how do you foster these conditions that allow emergence of adaptive governance, but also how do you support some degree of institutionalization across the current range of approaches. And then last slide, just a few conclusions. Um, just that you know, laws and good decision-making process are necessary, but not sufficient. There's a, it's really important to have enhanced social capacity and trust. And uh, it's really important to engage diverse communities through social learning. Um, there are a lot of interesting processes there, like I said, that resulted in kind of transformational learning amongst individuals and, and epiphanies and aha moments. And, um, and then um, there, you know, the importance of meeting on the land and specific places with others. And, and I just want to point out that, of course, the tribal context might require really spe a special consideration, the, the need for rectification. Um, also, you need the support of the federal government for big, big. Um, efforts like this and, and money. And so interestingly, what was missing in 2010, 2010 when there was this, all this capacity at the local level to problem solve, what was missing was the money. Well, now here we are in 2021 and the Biden administration has just you know, thrown $162 million in the infrastructure bill at the Klamath Basin. But right now there's so little capacity that it's really questionable how well they'll be able to use that money. Um, but anyway, right now there's a need to rebuild collaborative capacity in the basin in order to address social and ecological problems at a basin scale. Like Harriet said, you really need the governance mechanisms to match the scale of the ecological problems. And, and right now we're back into this you know, siloed kind of uh, situation with broken trust and retrenchment. So that it's, it's un unclear how to move forward, but the, it, the Klamath case really provides interesting stories of what's possible and then you know, how it can all fall apart if you don't institutionalize it. So thank you for your patience there. It's a lot. It's hard to talk about the Klamath in eight minutes. <laughs> wow, what a story! Uh, I don't think I've heard that narrative for you, Hannah, and that that was um, that was a really, really compelling, interesting, disappointing story with lots and lots of lessons. And I I see an analog to what Harriet was talking about about this kind of disconnect between local level implementation and regional scale coordination, but it's almost like now you're taking it up to between this regional level coordination and the need to coordinate that with the federal and legislative spheres. So really fascinating. I'm, I'm gonna, in spite of my better instincts, I'm gonna go off script and just ask if any of the other panelists would like to respond right now to anything that Hannah presented or draw any other connections that from any of the presentations that any of you have just given. I'll make a quick comment on what Tanya presented, which I really um, appreciated. She talked about uh, adaptive governance as a, uh, and I think Hannah repeated that, the culture of learning. And I really love that diagram that you had, Tanya, that was like feeding into like, you learn, you go back, you back to the board and come back. And we do a lot of uh, data analysis in my team. And, you know, that's what machine learning is, right? You keep taking the information and then readjust yourself and rethink the process and um, come up with better answers. And I think uh, in the way of machine learning, it's faster, it just does 
you know, go quickly. I think when humans are involved, it can get messy and get complicated. But at the end of the day, what we are realizing in this century, I think, is just the value of how you take knowledge and information and readjust and rethink whatever you're doing and make it better or optimize it from an, uh, you know, uh, sort of system level thinking. How do you optimize yourself based on new information? And I think it's just such an interesting sort of uh, analogy that I have never even thought about. I always talk about adaptive governance. I always talk about machine learning, but I never thought about them as, a, as an interlinked process. Yeah, I like that, Nisha. And I, I think keeping in mind too, that it's, it's not just a, adapting kind of our, our technical approach to how we manage social ecological systems, that, but that we're using that information to help us understand values, the structure of the governance system, and you know more of these human and institutional processes that we have to learn about. Sometimes, you know, it's even harder to learn about the, those elements of the system. And I, I think Hannah gave a you know a really nice just presentation on how that can happen. And even still, at the end of the day, when that learn, type of learning goes on, it's not it's it's necessary, but it's not sufficient to. Um, building a kind of a long-term robust adaptive governance system. And um, these systems are, are fragile and if we don't have that connectivity across scales of governance too, then you know, it's, it's really, it's difficult to operate adaptive governance in, in kind of isolation of just you know, one, one scale of decision-making or with certain actors that have authority, but not all of the actors. So it's, it's a challenge. That is a great transition, I think, this conversation about learning into um, the next question that we were going to talk about. Um, so having covered kind of the, the background on what is adaptive governance, I wanted to pivot us to think about why it's significant. And from what I've seen in the literature, you know, academics will link adaptive governance with various desired outcomes, um, things like support for adaptive management social ecological resilience, equity. And so I wanted to hone in on those a little bit more. Um, and so starting with adaptive management, which is I think probably most all of you know is a, is a topic of great interest uh, in an active area here in the Delta. Um, so I wanted to really focus on what that looks like, this relationship that Tanya articulated uh, at a theoretical and conceptual level for us between adaptive governance and adaptive management. And I was wondering if we could hear maybe some examples, some more concrete examples of specific processes or institutions or governance mechanisms that support adaptive management. Um, and maybe we'll start with you, Tanya, if you can provide some Delta examples and then we'll, if others have thoughts, can chime in. Yeah, sure. Um, well, one, one thing I would mention, and this goes back to some of the, the work that Mark Lubell presented in the, in the first, a webinar of this series, uh, which was related to a, a survey uh, Mark and I and others did of the, the Delta kind of science enterprise actors trying to understand their perceptions of adaptive management and the, the kind of the efficacy of different stages of adaptive management. And, and one of the things we found, which I think Mark might have highlighted in his talk, I just don't remember how much depth he went into it, was that you know there, there's a, a pretty um, positive perception of the capacity, some of the elements of the capacity for adaptive management in the Delta. And, and I think a lot of that is because it's infused into the institutional design of the Delta plan and, and you know, the, the structures and institutions that, that, that govern the Delta. We talk about it a lot. It's, it's something that we recognize as a, as a priority. But we also found in that survey that those perceptions of kind of efficacy are higher amongst people involved in venues that have better leadership, trust, and engagement. <laughs> and, and it's not necessarily an issue of resources in the Delta, but it's, a, it's, it's an issue of those, those kind of social learning mechanisms. Um, Hannah mentioned that, and um, you know, I mentioned it before as well, but I, I would just reemphasize that those, those kind of social dynamics have to be infused into the kind of adaptive governance structures that then enable, I think, the you know, more effective adaptive management. It's not that it can't occur, adaptive management can't occur without 
you know, this, this kind of supportive framework of adaptive governance, but um, they, they really do intertwine. And, the, and I would say those, those, yeah, again, those kind of social and, and process-based kind of principles are, are really essential, at least from what I've seen in the Delta. Really interesting social and, and relationships, it sounds like, too. It's really important. Nusha, did you want to chime in? I just wanted to say, actually, one thing that it's um, often sort of plays a huge role when you're going from governance to management is also transparency and trust. Uh, you know, it's and and transparency very much is related to uh, in better information, trust in the system. And um, I think one thing that when it comes to adaptive management, which is which very much of an action oriented process, right? You have to feel, you know, actually management is often where we meet those outcomes or performances that we are looking for uh, while governance sort of feeds into that as a process. So, or, or institutions that help sort of define those um, those goals. And I think when you have better data and information, uh, that can actually sometimes lead to creating more transparency, more trust across the board, manage, you know, and also bring more people together to kind of collaboratively manage something. Um, think about, for example, uh, Delta, uh, you know, and think about all the different decision makers that are across the board dealing with decisions that are taking that are taken day by day and impacts Delta, but they are sort of disconnected from Delta in so many ways, right? Uh, you know, from my perspective, for example, water utilities, some are very much uh, uh, paying attention to what's going on in the Delta, some might not as much just because they are not necessarily, uh, it's not informing their day-to-day -day management decisions, right? So, um, however, every single one of those decisions can have a ripple effect on how uh, the health and well-being of the Delta is measured. Um, so kind of that, that, and when there is no transparency or information that informs this process, it's very, very difficult to, for people to kind of um, understand how and where they get into this process and how and where they can um, provide, um, so they can have a feedback loop into the process. One, one quick example of this is, for example, think about our water rights system in California, right? It's, it's very complex. It's, it's based on use it or lose it, right? So then when you're talking about management and um, health of the ecosystem, it's just these two totally clash because you have to have a system that says, okay, if I am not using my water and I'm I'm not losing it, I'm leaving it for someone else to use it, right? But if I, it's a, if it's a, a sort of a, dealt with as a very specific precedent from the law, that's not how it's gonna get measured, right? I didn't use this much water, so that way in a few years, I'm gonna lose the right to that water. Um, so this disconnect is re it's quite real when it comes to a collective action across around a water body ecosystem, for example, in Delta's case, like the heart of our actual water system um, that, is, um, that is defining a lot of different uh, and the ecosystem bodies that are, that are dependent on it. But if we don't really um, if we don't really have a good way of ha enabling collaborative governance, um, and it can actually be problematic um, in that sense. Really interesting. Thanks, Nusha. And that takes us back to our last webinar series also, which focused on collaborative governance and, and the importance of creating those venues where people can come together and, and build relationships, build trust, and also, you know, engage in the collective action and solve those problems together. Um, I wanna move us along in the interest of time to um, the topic of resilience, which again is one of the, as, as um, Tanya, I think all of you touched on this to some extent in some way, um, one of those desirable outcomes that's associated with uh, adaptive governance. And so I was interested to hear uh, specific to the Delta, what sorts of um, your reflections on what sorts of governance arrangements or processes are needed to facilitate adaptation that will promote long-term resilience in the Delta. And I wanna start with Harriet here. I, I, you already shared some thoughts, but I'm wondering if you could focus a little bit more on the particular like 
aspects of the governance system that might be conducive to long-term adaptation. Yeah, definitely. Um, so as I mentioned already, big issues like transportation planning, housing allocation, all of that already occurs at a regional level. And that's what I you know, think really the direction we should be heading. Um, you know, the, the idea of regionalism and, and planning on a regional basis is, is not new by, by any means, um, but it's not um, necessarily, there, there is no regional entity um, with that authority, with a dedicated stream of funding in the Delta um, to implement climate adaptation. So, um, so what I want to bring up a, a good example, uh, so with transportation funding and, and planning specifically, um, that there is an entity with authority and funding, and the, those are the metropolitan planning organizations in California. And the federal government essentially designates these MPOs, the metropolitan planning organizations throughout the state. And these MPOs are required to maintain regional transportation plans and sustainable community strategies. And they're required to work with local governments to make sure they have input and their local and regional plans are consistent. So then future transportation improvements that are consistent with that plan are eligible for federal funding. So really transportation needs, land use and air quality are linked. So I, I'm suggesting some type of regional governance structure similar to this um, for, for adaptation. Um, because under this structure, there's local and regional um, coordination is required, efforts have to be consistent. It requires a long-term vision to be developed and a plan to implement that vision. There's funding. Um, and also there's an environmental review that has already been done and prepared for the regional plan. So all pro projects consistent with that plan has a much lighter lift um, for CEQA compliance. So that saves um, jurisdictions money. So we hope that Delta adapts will become um, the long-term vision and plan for adaptation for this region of the Delta. You know, we are working hard um, with various stakeholders, including the cities and counties, vulnerable communities, tribal communities, and, and really many others to develop this plan. Um, but we don't have the funding um, or the authority to implement it. We're really relying on many other entities at various levels to implement adaptation. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not suggesting the council, you know, is should be that entity. Entity. There are many other regional collaboratives in place now, and those authorities can be expanded. Um, another option, um, again, I haven't had any conversations with MPOs or or very many others, you know, even within my own organization. But you know, the role of those MPOs can also be expanded to include adaptation. This would, of course, require a change in legislation, but the underlying framework and structure is already in place. So those are just some ideas. And, and I think, you know, this, uh, this regional entity um, with dedicated funding would help build long-term resilience in the Delta. Awesome. Thank you, Harriet. That's really clear articulation of the the needs and possible pathways forward. And um, I liked your, you dropped your um, regional authority with dedicated funding and teeth part. I like the and teeth part of that. Um, do others have thoughts that I'd like to share uh, connecting adaptive governance to resilience, specific governance processes, structures, mechanisms that promote resilience, particularly in light of climate change? I'll add quickly to this. I think Harriet said, it. Perfectly, but you know, we are actually our goals and objectives have shifted. Alpha actually had asked that question as well. Unless we, I mean, I think money is key in this process. Unless you really provide resources um, to for for some of these solutions to be implemented, we really cannot move forward because this requires resources and money. And the second thing is, um, you know, shifting our thinking and objectives and goals are also very important because remember a lot of goals and objectives and laws that we have in place are set for whatever understanding we had of the system in the past few centuries, right? Now we are in a totally different area, totally different challenges, totally different opportunities. And unfortunately, our regulatory system is not designed to make massive shifts which is actually in some cases is not a bad thing because you want to gradually change to make sure you don't make a huge mistake in this process. But that adaptive governance and adaptive change can enable us to gradually move this massive ship 
to kind of towards the goals and objectives, the new goals and objectives that we have in place. And I think those regional, regional authorities, if they really do have the resources and clear objectives and goals in their hand, um, they potentially can enable some of this shift and change to happen. Um, but definitely having feet and money is, is key in this process. Thanks, Susha. Yeah, again, that balance between stability and flexibility, I think the theme that I'm hearing there. Um, again, in the interest of time, I'll move on to the, the last of the, these three kind of desirable outcomes that I wanted to ask you all to reflect on is equity. Um, and again, Tanya reflected on some of these principles, if you will, of adaptive governance that seem very well aligned with equity, inclusiveness, and diversity. Um, and Hannah, you talked about the tribal involvement, for example. So um, yeah, I'd like to just ask um, each of you to, to reflect for a minute or so uh, from your experience to, to talk about this relationship between adaptive governance uh, and equity and how that relationship can be uh, designed or strengthened so that those two um, sort of these two desirable ends, like kind of overall system governance, flexibility and responsiveness and equity can be mutually enforcing of one another. Um, so let's start with uh, Tanya and then we'll move to Hannah, Harriet and Nusha. Sure. Well, I guess I, I would um, kind of bring us back to a point that Nusha made about you know, our institutions and, and I think Hannah reinforced this as well, our institutions being designed you know, for 20th century um, issues or, or 19th century <laughs> Um, issues often, and and when we think about our our kind of our our laws and policies and institutions, they reflect our values. And if we want to have an ad adaptive governance system, we need to be adaptive to new values. We can't be rigid within the old values that we had in in those kind of laws and policies and institutional structures. And so. Equity in, in adaptive governance is about giving people shared or equal opportunities in the process. So the, there's equity in the process for some of those new values that are coming you know, into play in, in our um, social and ecological systems to really you know, have a voice in, in how we're going to govern for, for the future. And so, you know simply including diverse voices in governance processes, um, you know, just to inform decision making isn't enough. You need to also pay attention to who has power and authority, and that plays an important role in equity as well. And, you know, when you start bringing in new voices and giving them more power and authority uh, in decision making, that can be threatening to existing interests. So I think it really needs to also be clear, you know, how such changes in the governance system to bring more equity and voice can be beneficial um, and normatively just the right thing to do. So if we care about the resilience of ecological systems, then for instance, we need traditional ecological knowledge and we need ongoing dialogue between various kind of ways of knowing that may not be represented in those existing kind of institutional arrangements. So I think that you know, really is um, important. And you look at that maybe in the Klamath process, I think that is an interesting um, question perhaps for Hannah to reflect on. Yeah, well, um, I think um, uh, thinking about the Klamath case, a, a key factor in the success of the KBRA and KHSA, at least at the, was successful at the local and state level, if not the federal, was that uh, it explicitly dealt with the need to rectify past wrongs against indigenous peoples in both the upper and lower basins. The dams coming out would have addressed salmon decline in the lower basin, um, and the dams still are going to come out. So that, that's still like KHSA did go forward, KBRA did not. Um, the tribes would have gotten land back as part of the KBRA, they were gonna, they would be, the government would have bought them the Mazama tree farm. There was gonna be money for restoration for the fish that were important to the tribes and also money just for economic development in general. Uh, so social restoration as well as ecological restoration. And as, formal, as former uh, tribal chairman, Alan Foreman once said, um, it's a great quote that I use all the time, there's rectification that has to be done. And without that, this basin is not going to move forward. And um, so now that um, so the KBRA had a focus on social as well as ecological restoration as a holistic integrated approach, 
now that the KBRA didn't get funded, tribes have had their rights um, quantified. It turns out they control uh, their their rights go their rights go back to the time immemorial, and they the quantified rights are basically they control most of the water in the upper basin, and they're not, not interested in collaborating anymore. And so you know it, it it's just it just goes to show like it with with the rise in tribal sovereignty all around the world, um, as tribes gain more legal power, if not political power, but as they gain more legal power, it's going to be more and more important to figure out how can we rectify past wrongs because without that. You're not going to be able to get stuff done. So I just think that, that there's some really instructive lessons there in the famine. Yeah, and quickly for Delta Adapt, you know, as a planner, obviously addressing equity and, and taking in that input and, and how it affects governance in the future is something that I've been working on for a really long time and, and really standard practice for all the work that we do. Um, but for Delta Adapt specifically, this was really the first initiative at the council where we made big strides in addressing equity. So that's been very exciting. And we really made a concerted effort in the very beginning to forge those relationships with various community-based organizations and, and service providers to understand you know, what vulnerable communities need, um, really to gather input into our process. And um, through these partnerships, we're able to design and hold three workshops um, in vulnerable communities in the Stockton area and West Sacramento last year. Um, and also through these relationships, we've um, also been able to form an environmental justice expert group um, that we meet with regularly to advise our work in this realm. Um, and then for the adaptation plan itself, we're continuing on um, without you know, the expansive outreach. And now we're trying to expand our efforts really to talk with um, more tribes, um, homeless and farm worker communities. Um, so, you know, we're making, continuing to make um, strides in this effort and it's, it's, it's you know, ongoing and, and a lot of work and, and by no means done, um, but it'll be something that we have to continue on um, and really about engaging those sectors that normally don't participate in planning processes and really getting them to engage so that we can have a, more equitable and a better adaptation plan. So that's what I would say about that. And I think a lot of the important thing has been mentioned. And um, I think one, one thing that I will reemphasize from what Tanya said is just because people are at the table and they're expressing their um, opinion doesn't mean that they are impacting the process. Because again, process is derived derived by objectives and goals, and if those objectives and goals are not reflecting uh, uh, correctly of a broader, uh, you know, diverse group of people's needs and um, and uh, requirements, it would not necessarily lead into the outcome we are uh, thinking about. So it's important to create real space. For example. Um, think about our regulatory processes. People who know exactly how to go through that regulatory processes, they know either they hire a consultant, for example, I'm just giving you a very, very specific example. They can hire a consultant, that consultant knows how to exactly fill these forms, how to do it right, what kind of calculation to do, demonstrate what kind of outcomes are required. And imagine in that process, you say, oh, there are members of that community who are interested in this project, who want to express their opinion. They just come and simply express their um, like or dislike of the process, but that doesn't necessarily change that outcome because they don't necessarily have the technical capacity or their needs and requirements are not part of that performance measure process that we are requiring out of these um, uh, out of these uh, systems. So, um, so I would actually say, in addition to everything that we talked about, in addition to creating these shared goals and objectives, and create making we need to make sure our institutions are also diverse. So it has people who can actually on a daily basis can think about these things and provide feedback on uh, how we need to adjust ourselves to make sure we are meeting 21st century challenges. Um, and if it's not that way, it's very difficult to use the same model that we have had, the same bodies, the same thinking, the same technical capacity, and expect to have a different outcome just because we say we care about equity and justice. Such important points and just really astute reflection. Thank you all very much. 
Um, I'm going to do a little bit of adaptive moderating here and skip around in our uh, outline that we've prepared. I do want to leave a bit of time because there are some questions from the audience. But one topic, I'm going to move ahead to this question um, about the water, water operation system, the water supply system, um, and going back, I think, largely to what, what you were talking about, Nusha. You know, we have in the Delta, the governance system is, is closely intertwined with this very precisely engineered extensive physical infrastructure along around water management. So I'm wondering if you could reflect on the on the implications of that engineered system a little bit more. Um, and you know, specifically to what extent or how do these water operations and water delivery systems create rigidity and what sorts of changes in governance do you think are needed to meaningfully enhance kind of the adaptive flexibility responsiveness of our governance system? Um, and we'll start with Nusha and then ask if others want to chime in. You know, the interesting thing when it comes to bad water management is, is the sort of confluence of two things. One is because of climate change, our water systems are dealing with a significant uh, and unprecedented uncertainty in how much water they have and how they should manage it to make sure they meet the reliability that's required of them. On top of that, we have ecosystem that's falling apart due to climate change and due to this, some of these rigid management rules that we have in place. And it's just very difficult when you, um, when you look at these two, because for example, in the, um, of course, a lot of many water utilities do care about ecosystem health, but that is not their calling. Their calling is to make sure the water comes out of tap when people open their tap and it's clean and it's accessible. And um, so it makes it very, very difficult to kind of have these co-benefits cool work together or, co or coexist at the same time when your calling is not that, right? So going back to this whole shared uh, visions and shared um, uh, rules and uh, requirements, I think it's just, um, it, it really needs, we need, we really do need to have a shift in what do we need by management and making sure good actors are, um, are not going to be dealing with um, legal consequences of whatever they're doing. And going back to, again, I know the water rights system is a very complex system in California. And in the recent um, event I was at, I said, it just requires a giant a um, hero who would be willing to kind of take this thing and just, uh, you know, get rid of it or fix it or put it back together in a correct way or the way that it actually meets the challenges of the today. Um, but the reality is a lot of these water managements is driven by water rights systems. And if the water rights system is not reflecting uh, the health of the ecosystem, and um, how it needs to be adjusted for that, it makes it very difficult. And also remember, in one of my slides, I said, when we build all this system, we left people and ecosystem out, right? We just didn't give the, you know, and people by people, I meant not just because people like, for example, diverse set of voices, but also people like you and I who depend in these water systems. And we really are not thinking about it, right? I, I you know, Average person might care about water coming out of their tab. They're not thinking about the, oh, I wasted this water so the salmon doesn't have water. That's all they're thinking. They're not connecting the dots, really. Um, so, uh, so educating people is key because then these utilities can actually change their behavior in a way that reflects our environmental goals and objectives, as well as their goals and objective of meeting reliability and water reliability. If you tell people, get rid of your lawns because then we can save the salmon, they just, you know, they may really understand, they may understand that some people do understand that, but a lot of them don't because they don't even know where the water is coming from and which river it's flowing through and which dam is giving them the providing them water or uh, they may not ever have been there to know what does that mean. So, um, so bringing people and ecosystem as right holders into this process is key as well. Thank you, Nisha. Um, does anybody else want to reflect on this question before we move on to some audience questions? Okay, great. This has been amazing. Um, thank you all. 
We have had some good discussion. I see some comments from um, Alf Brandt in the chat. And I saw you responded to one of those earlier. Thank you. Um, but we do have some questions as well. So Beck, can you um, read out our audience questions for us? Sure, we have a question from Katie. Um, they ask, what's the role of shared data systems and adaptive governance? Are there examples of regional authorities or other networks of actors with shared values but differing authority where data sharing systems are supporting more collaborative and effective decision making? Barriers to implementing these? Anyone want to take that one on, Nusha? Just, just a quick comment here, and that's shared data can actually, or shared shared tools can provide some baseline that we work off of. Right now, we are not even having shared data or shared model that we try, we rely, we sort of we all agree on, uh, and it's very difficult when people are using different data sets and different models to give different answers and. Um, and that that's and it's very difficult to kind of create a cooperation and collaboration across the board when you don't have a baseline of work you are sort of depending on and everybody agrees on and then working off of. Yeah, and I would just add too that partly that's a function of the you know differing regulatory requirements that trigger the type of monitoring that we do in you know systems like the Delta and you know, each agency has its own monitoring requirements and, and regulatory mandates that they have to meet that, that drive that type of data collection. And that in effect creates, you know, some of the mismatch we see in terms of the type of data being collected, the scale at which that data are collected, um, you know, the time frame of the, of the data. So it, the, yeah, the coordination and sharing of data is, is a, serious challenge, but I think the Katie raises a really good point that that can help provide some kind of shared baseline knowledge if we can think in more creative ways about, you know, how, how do we create a learning system? And, you know, one of them is one of the, the resources in a learning system is having shared knowledge and shared understanding of what those system dynamics are. And I think we need more conversations around you know, where can we align some of the, the data sets that we have? And, and that's something that the, the Delta Independent Science Board has recommended in its um, monitoring review, review that it just completed was, you know, the need to have a more kind of institutionalized approach to coordinating monitoring across the Delta. Just had to get an ISB plug in there. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to just say one quick thing. Um, um, I did I did write a whole article about this, so I'd refer you to that if you're interested. But I was really interested in the process leading up to the development of the nation's first joint biological opinion between the Fish and Wildlife Service and NIMS back in 2013 in the Klamath Basin. And one of the really cool, the coolest things about this story was that there was this collaborative hydrological um, modeling effort led by the Klamath tribes that involved Fish and Wildlife Service and key stakeholders and NIMS and the Bureau. And um, one of the barriers to people getting on the same page about how to how to manage the system as a whole, like the whole basin, was um, the Fish and Wildlife Service didn't have a hydrologist on staff at the time. And so Fish and Wildlife Service went and hired a hydrologist specifically to be involved in these negotiations so that they could speak the same language with the Bureau and some of the other stakeholders. And, um, and that was you know, considered to be a really key move. And um, so just that getting together, learning how the system, the whole system works together, um, this like that 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 social and technical learning opportunity created the space for them to figure out. All right, let's create a joint biological opinion that deals with upper basin and lower basin together instead of in a separate approach like Fish and Wildlife Service does the upper basin, NIMS does the lower basin. So, yeah, it was just kind of a neat a neat thing that you know that the, the ologies. You know, if you don't have people who speak the same language, uh, the same same kinds of scientists representing the different agencies, you're going to have real um, communication barriers. Super interesting. Thanks, Hannah. Great insight. Um, in our last like minute, I do see another question. Beck, do you want to paraphrase the question for? And I think maybe Harriet would be a good person to take this one. Uh, sure. Brett asks: um, Region is a slippery concept. It requires making of boundaries and choices and qualities that are used to draw them: geography, governance, values, etc. Um, there are issues of scale and equity here where the edges are drawn, thoughts on how region can be actively defined. 
So I, I just want to be clear that I have not had extensive conversations internally with anyone. So just, you know, to, and, and I am not at all um, advocating that, you know, the council um, should be that entity. I just want to be clear on that. Um, yeah, region regionalism, of course, you know, regional entity to uh, what I'm suggesting is not the perfect answer. There are downsides to it. Um, you know, again, that push and pull of local control, um, you know, the idea here, though, in any form of, um, of addressing anything regionally means that there has to be active partners and all partners have to be involved and has to have a stake at, you know, whatever you come up with and um, input into the process and, and what gets actually adopted. And that includes what the region, how the region is defined. Um, people, you know, they're, it's not the perfect answer, um, but, but conceptually, if you do it together, all the partners, whether there is a regional entity with teeth or not, you have to work together with everyone um, in that region. So conceptually, then everyone gets something out of it. Um, you know, it's not the perfect answer, but it is a potential solution. That's great. Thank you, Harriet. Unfortunately, I feel like we could keep going, but we are actually a minute over. So I just want to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists. This was just an amazing conversation, so informative and insightful. And I really appreciate all of you taking the time to put together your presentations and have this conversation. And I hope that we can continue the conversation in other venues uh, in and outside the Delta. Uh, and big thank you as well to Beck for uh, running our show and helping with the QA. And thanks to everybody who attended to today, uh, today's webinar. I will be emailing uh, once the recording is available and that will be posted online as well. Um, but yes, thank you everybody. And I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Chelsea. Thank, thank you so everybody. much. Bye. Everybody. Thank you. Are you still here or are you leaving, Hannah? <laughs> oh, um, I'm still here. Yeah. It was really good. That was such a great presentation. Thank you. Oh, thanks. I know I went over. I didn't have time. I was trying and trying and trying to chop it down, chop it down, chop it down. And then I ran out of time to. <laughs>